Hi everyone, welcome to this open core told hour on musical interludes. I am Leila, the Research Forum Programme Manager here at the Courtauld, and I want to start by saying the biggest thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies for their generous support of our digital initiatives, especially anything within the Open Courtauld strand. Now, music is a subject really close to my heart. Lots of my family and friends are musicians, and the pandemic has been a real struggle for them and those in the industry. So this event is really to celebrate, champion and commission the work that they do, to align with Mental Health Awareness Week and the announcement this morning of Money in Mind at Ferrens Art Gallery, where Antibes will be on display. So onto the relationship between art and music. From defining subject matter to influencing style, harmony, melody, rhythm and colour in art's physical manifestation, music also promotes mindfulness in the gallery sphere. Music can allow a deeper immersion and interpretation of our collection, for example, which is something we will cover properly later on in the hour. And actually, Visual Arts Symphony, the reciprocal nature between the visual arts and the musical world, is all the more clear when art acts as the source of inspiration for music as well. In this hour, then, we will travel back in time and across the globe to India, revisit our pre-renovation musical programme here at the Courtauld, be joined by our national partners at Hull, Future Ferens, and lastly, to round up, we will have a one-off musical interpretation of Claude Monet's Antibes. So this hour is designed to encourage us all to find mindfulness and mental well-being through enjoying art and music together. And as usual, this hour will consist of short segments to give you all a taste of the subject. And I will be asking questions to our speakers throughout. So please pop any that you have into the chat box. Um, alternative to, alternatively, you can send them to us on social media. We are at Courtauld Res with the hashtag open Courtauld hour. Okay, on to the actual event now. It is my pleasure to introduce you all to Catherine Schofield. Catherine is senior lecturer in South Asian music and history at King's College London. She's a historian of music and listening in Mughal, India, and she's also an expert in paracolonial Indian Ocean. She trained as a viola player before embarking on her PhD at SOAS and came to King's after a research fellowship at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and a lectureship at Leeds. I have admired Catherine's work for a while now, so I am thrilled she agreed to join us this evening to talk about South Asian courtesans, women who were actually artists, musicians, and dancers in their own right. And it's actually this musicality and its transition into art that we're going to have a quick tour of <laughs> in the next 10 minutes. So thank you, Catherine. I can see you're on camera now. So thank you for taking the time to speak to me this evening and welcome to the virtual court old. Yes, it's it's lovely to to, to see you and because you're actually my neighbour um, uh, when when you're in your uh, usual building because uh, Kings and uh, Courtauld are next to each other on the Strand, so it's a bit sad to have you so far away at the moment. But <laughs> you'll come back. <laughs> so to kick off our conversation, I wanted to ask, what do we mean by the term courtesan, and what was their direct relationship with music, musicality through dance, and the visual arts? Sure. Well, I've got some um, beautiful examples of Indian art stretching over about a thousand years, which I'd like to share with everybody. Um, I'll just make that into a slideshow. Um, and um, so this one is a, um, a celestial dancer um, from the Chandela dynasty in central India. And those of you who are familiar with Indian art will um, know the Kajuraho temples, which have these incredibly beautiful erotic sculptures. And this is actually from um, the peak of those around the 11th, the 11th century. Um, and the tradition of courtesanship in India goes back at least 2000 years in, in documented history and courtesans are really these special communities of Indian women who specialize in the courtly arts for the entertainment of men um, and you know particularly music dance and poetry but they were also connoisseurs of the arts of sex um, and there were also um, men who performed the role of courtesans as well but I'm, I'm going to largely be talking about women um, and any um, public women performing in male space in Indian art whether that be sculptures um, or on the painted page uh, are very likely to be courtesans. Um, so they're a really iconic figure in Indian art. So 
because they were professional mistresses, they lay outside dynastic marriage. So they were kind of liminal. Um, they operated in male space and they were both more and less than women. So they weren't given the protection of marriage, but they had this hugely influential role um, at court. So this connection of music and dance and the movement of emotion um, and, and the erotic with courtesans dates back at least to the Sanskrit text, the Nati Shastra about 2000 years ago. And of course, um, Vatsyayana's Kama Sutra. Um, and um, the Kama Sutra was not just um, a sex manual. Um, it's very much about the arts and the etiquette of the gentleman about town and the courtesan or Vesha. Um, and, um, and of course, you know, if you have a look at this incredibly beautiful um, example, which is now in the Met Museum, you can see all these beautiful bells that are hanging from her, um, her waist um, and her hips, and there's one snaking down her knee there, and these would all have... Um, uh, made music as, as she walked and as she conducted her arts of seduction. Um, but um, Vatsyayana in the Kama Sutra says that um, the great courtesan has to be skilled in the 64 arts of the skilled person, which include singing and playing on musical instruments and dancing and so on, but also writing, drawing, trimming, decorating, magic, tailoring, carpentry, architecture, chemistry, um, cockfighting, uh, and especially things like the rules of society and etiquette. And when she is proficient in these arts, says Vatsyayana in the Kama Sutra, she becomes a Ganika and receives a seat of honor in the assembly of men. So I'm quoting there. Um, and so she becomes equal with men. Um, and with her mastery of the sexual arts, she also becomes the ideal partner for the cultivated gentleman about town in ancient and medieval India. I love that. I love that cockfighting was on, on the list of the, <laughs> the skills that a woman should have. Um, but yeah, that actually is one of the things that really draws me to this type of research. Um, I think when you think about femininity in this way and the strength and the creativity that it allows for, but the fact mm. that we often consider the feminine um, a lesser, it's really interesting. Yeah. And as you've just said, the stories of these women span a huge time period and we obviously don't have the capacity to cover no. it all today but I wanted to ask more generally how important these women were actually as bearers of high culture as well as being sex workers. Yeah they, they, they were hugely important over the last thousand years as these bearers of high culture. I'm going to pass on to um, we're going to skip over 600 years at this point um, and we're going to move forward to the Mughal period um, and this is a great painting from the Padishah Nama, the historical chronicle of the uh, reign of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, which is in Windsor Castle in the Royal Collection. Um, so this one's copyright of Her Majesty the Queen. Um, and this one shows courtesans Kanchani, um, known as the Gilded Ones, who were the hereditary community by this point, who were a matrilineal community who performed as the elite dancers and singers um, at the Mughal court. And you see them here um, accompanied by all the great male artists known as Kalawant, which means artist, um, on the right-hand side of the painting here, uh, looking all rather stern while they um, do these, this beautiful dancing. Um, and um, and one thing you might notice actually is that um, their physique is not unfamiliar from the Chandela example that we've just seen. So these large globular breasts and the kind of tiny pinched waist um, and the, the large voluptuous hips um, indicating um, Yes, sexuality, but also their power as auspicious women. So it was really important that they attended all life cycle events to bless uh, life cycle events, marriages, coronations. Here, this is the birthday weighing of Shah Jahan in 1632. Um, and they brought auspiciousness upon the occasion. They were known as Mangalam, 
Mukki, which means uh, auspicious face or auspicious presences. Um, and they were essential from that point of view. Um, but they were also, of course, um, they were really important keepers of tradition and preservers of it and transmitters of it. And this goes to both the arts of dance, um, to the arts of singing in particular, in particular the forms, the ghazal, tumri, um, uh, and in this period, khayal, which is, you know, one of the high classical genres now. Um, they also composed their own poetry uh, in Persian and then later in Urdu. Um, but they were also repositories of correct etiquette for the court and noblemen would send their their sons to a courtesan not just so that she could initiate him into the sexual arts but also so that he would learn proper courtly etiquette from her um so they were enormously important from that point of view and actually this continued right through um into the british period and out the other side so i've got one more um uh, uh illustration i want to show you which is from 1832 um and this actually shows the courtesan in her um role as a um as a singer and here she is singing and you can see her open mouth and she's also doing what's known as seated up so she's actually doing the eye movements that go with the lyrics um, and the hand gestures while still sitting and performing. Um, and this is a fascinating, um, this is a lithograph based after an original which is in the British Library um, and um, it's of uh, done by somebody called Mrs. Belnos. And what's fascinating is that the the intimacy of these two uh, English women um, with this courtesan who's very close to them. Um, and we do have evidence that they treated these women much like sort of opera divas or something like that. Um, but also that we have this kind of mixed collection of men standing, both British men and Indian men. Um, and so they actually became really important source of entertainment for British men um, and, and any women who were particularly who were up country so past Calcutta uh, in North India um, throughout the um, the early 19th century um, so you know really important as entertainers um, but they also you know continued this role as professional mistresses because of course British men also took them as mistresses and a lot of courtesans were in fact indentured in what was known as the Lal Bazaar which was attached to British um, yeah, so East India Company regiments um, and of course the best and the most beautiful and the most talented courtesans were reserved for the white officers. Um, so you have these essential keepers and transmitters of both the dance forms that are now known as Katak and of song, song genres, Ghazal and Tumri in particular, but also they're continuing these roles as these professional mistresses. That's um, so fascinating, especially the comparison to before the East India Trading mm -hmm. Company and then after, but I don't want to get started on that because then <laughs> we'll, we'll be here all day. But yeah, I really, really love the detail in the first image you showed of their mm. clothing and the headpieces. And I think that that to me just displays the, the opulence, the status and yeah, the significant sphere that these women occupied at that point. Yeah. Um, and I wondered before I moved on to a question from the audience. So yes, please put questions in the chat if you have any and um, if you had any more examples that you wanted to show us yeah I have this one last one uh this one's my favorite and there are I could have shown you hundreds um you know from all periods of of, of beautiful art from all periods but this one's my favorite her name is Malagir she's a real woman um she was a courtesan in Delhi um and this painting was done of her on the 3rd of September 1815 and it was done by um, an artist called Lalji or possibly his son Hulas Lal for one of the Fraser brothers William or James Fraser and this is from the famous Fraser album and Lalji was a pupil of Zofany um, and so we actually have here a merging of um, British and Indian artistic style so you have the use of this extremely exquisite miniature work but you also have you know, at, for the first time in this period, the courtesans, instead of being, you know, um, in 
full profile as they were in the Shah Jahan um, example. Here she's looking straight at us as if she's looking, you know, slightly later in photography, straight at the camera. Um, and this is something new, which comes in with company style painting. But also the other things I love about her are her things like her monobrow. Um, and, um, and if you look very closely at this painting, she's also got a little bit of a moustache. And it's quite clear that this was attractive at the time, you know, this facial hair. Um, and so she has this incredibly distinctive personality. And James Fraser wrote this in his diary or in a letter. Um, After dinner, we go to see a notch at Bowani Shankar's, the old Bakshi of Holkar. The notch proved very good. Um, Malagia distinguished herself much, again, both in the simple notches, notch meaning dance, and in the bearer's dance, which is where the women dressed as men and hoiked their skirts up and wore turbans to dance in a masculine style. I have ordered her picture to be done in one of her attitudes. And here she is in one of her attitudes. And this is her with this very seductive, uh, distinctive, what they often called um, in British travel writing, waving her drapery. So she's got her um, her dupatta, her big shawl, and she's putting it round her head um, and perhaps over her eyes so that she can peep seductively up from underneath her, uh, her shawl there. Um, and um, yeah, this is just my absolute favorite. Um, I love her. So yeah, and it's a real privilege to show her. Yeah, totally amazing. And that actually ties in really well to one of the questions we just had on social media, which mm. is about whether there was a connection between um, the courtesans and mus the musicality of them, and then also Bollywood and the start of Bollywood. Oh yeah, there's a really close connection because a lot of the hereditary women who were courtesans and who were known in India under the collective title to wife, uh, were the first actresses in Bollywood, both in the silent film industry and also when they moved into sound cinema. And so for the first uh, sort of 40, you know, sort of um, first 20 years or so of the Bollywood film industry, the actresses also sang. So now they have playback singers who do the singing and the, the, the actresses do the dancing. But back then they did both. And a lot of those women came from courtesan backgrounds. Um, so yeah, there's a really close link. Thank you for bringing that up. That's amazing. Yeah, well, I didn't know that. So that's wonderful. Um, I'm very sad to say that that's all we have time for, Catherine. It was really wonderful <laughs> to talk to you. And I'm sure we'll do something again soon. And yeah, I'm, I bet everyone at home is just wondering about everything else they didn't know about Indian courtesans. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, now it's time for me to introduce you all to Charlotte. So Charlotte DeMille is a familiar face at the court all. She's a curator, writer, lecturer, and arts educator, a specialist in European modernism. Um, oh, I've disappeared. Um, European modernism and intersections of art, music, and philosophy. So today I'm delighted that Charlotte has agreed to join us to talk about something she was integral in before the gallery closed, our music program. And we're hopeful that today will give us all the chance to look back, to look forward and really imagine the amazing musical interventions we can have in our renovated gallery. So Charlie, thank you for joining us. If it's okay, I'll pass over to you to get started. Thanks, thanks Leila, and thanks so much for having me. Um, so for those of you who know the uh, gallery, I'm showing you some images here, one from room one, um, downstairs at the choir and choir singing here. and. Uh, and from when Peter Lely's, um the concert was in room four upstairs. Um, I'd like to preface this talk with a, um, a thought from Nietzsche, his method of sounding the idols with a tuning fork, as he writes in uh, Twilight of the Idols. And the idea here is to set um, his idols resonating, but not to break them. And this is a method that the art historian um, W.J.T. Mitchell, Tom Mitchell, has described as playing upon the idol, breaking the silence of the idol and transforming its hollowness into an echo chamber for human thought. And this is, uh, has been very much in my mind programming music at the Courtauld over many years. Um, the resonance and echo chamber quality of otherwise silent works of visual art and how we can um, imagine and re-enliven them. So with this context and background, I would suggest that the whole endeavour of art history um, in Nietzsche and Mitchell's terms is explicitly performative and musical. So 
Um, I began programming music at the Courtauld Gallery um, late 2008, early 2009, and the um, the remit was really um, as a way of contextualising the collection. It offered performance and research opportunities to postgraduate students and recent graduates from conservatoires, um, and it also um, offered the opportunity for public participation. So. My slide on the right here is from um, a community choir, the very first community choir event we had um, in the Peter Lilly uh, show in 2012. So I wanted to use music to promote understanding and enjoyment of art and art history and to engage the public more broadly with research and with um, the sort of interrelation between different arts. And so the programme has reached from um, research led events. Um, we supported two panels at the um, AAH conference in 2018 um, to widening participation in the schools project and there's more of that later. So in 2010, music became integral to our lates. Um, this is just um, one, uh, one example from uh, way back. Um, and we did this to shift the emphasis to a more informal learning um, method, but without compromising the integrity of the programme in relation to the exhibition. So in all cases, when we were programming late, things were very much, um, um, every aspect was connected to the exhibition or the theme um, drawn from the permanent collection. And so one of the most interesting examples of this was um, the music for the Court and Craft exhibition uh, in 2014. Um, where we commissioned a, an oud player, and he's here on the right-hand side, to play music that um, came from the, um, the courts of northern Iraq, um, inspired by the music, um, the, the iconography of music that is on this um, wonderful bag uh, in the collection. And um, curiously, this has just had a second life because the Holborn Museum, um, in showing this bag as part of Precious and Rare um, last year, um, contacted us to ask for our playlist um, from this event um, for their own um, exhibition um, last year. So, as I said, we've been employing postgraduates from music colleges um, across London, and we've been doing so to offer valuable experiences in unusual contextual and site specific performance. It's given them a chance to explore unusual repertoire and to work on programming um, with an art gallery, which is not usual either. It's offered the opportunity to interact more closely with um, a gallery audience, which is much more informal um, than a um, traditional concert um, hall allows. And this has benefited from um, both sides. The musicians um, could tick the personal development planning box um, for their degree certificates. Um, and the gallery, um, from the gallery's point of view, it was very helpful to be growing these higher education partnerships. Um, and so the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, that's one example here um, on the screen, um, has been our mainstay for the last few years, although they've not been the only. We've worked with the Academy, we've worked with Royal College of Music, um, and then outside the Conservatoires, uh, the Park Lane Group and the Young Classical Artists Trust, both of whom um, really work as sort of transition spaces between conservatoire and professional um, careers before musicians um, get uh, a formal agent. One of the most delightful projects has been the Guildhall's VoiceWorks programme, which um, ran between, um, in collaboration between 2017 and 2019. And this was a, coll a collaboration where the composition students at the Guildhall um, were, were, were briefed to write a short piece for voice and non-piano, any other instrument but not piano, um, based in and around the Courtauld's collection, its history, and its location. Um, and these pieces were then performed in situ in front of the relevant work or in the correct room or wh wh whichever the closest proximity was according to the piece that they'd, um, what had inspired them. Um, and so these were then world premieres performed in the gallery by the students um, with the composers present and they had to explain the piece, introduce the piece to their peers. Uh, one of the great successes was um, a piece by Jake Dorfman um, on this work, which is actually in the Arts Council collection, but was uh, hanging in the Courtauld um, in 2018. It's um, Lucian Freud's um, portrait of Kitty, um, his, his fiancée at the time, but Kitty Epstein. And the composer Jake um, did a lot of research about the relationship between Kitty and, um, and Freud and put some words into Kitty's mouth. So if we have time, I'll get, come back and I can play an extract of that. Um, afterwards. 
But why music and art in particular? Well, music offers, as Leila has already outlined, an alternative context to extend the discussion of visual artworks, and it provides a way to demonstrate common historical and cultural themes in any period. So comparison and juxtaposition um, can allow um, engagement with the methods and materials of artworks and exhibitions in ways that text um, sort of often falls short of. So academic questions relating to form, materiality or historical context, patronage and reception on the one hand, but also more museum um, based uh, questions relating to uh, audience development, innovation and participation. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples from uh, from the programme, starting with uh, this uh, slide from our Picasso exhibition, Picasso 1901, which looked at his blue period paintings um, and his harlequins. So we commissioned a mime artist to pose um, in a series of poses um, for a drawing workshop that was uh, that was accompanied to by music. And then we also asked him to um, create some sort of freestyle poses in 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 uh, in in relation to music. And the music we chose was by Renaldo An, um, a, a Venezuelan um, child prodigy and emigre to Paris, um, the direct contemporary of the child prodigy and um, Spanish emigre to Paris, Picasso. Um, and we chose a piece that reflected um, his, uh, his very sparse classical uh, language, musical language at the time of, of Picasso's um, blue period. And we contrasted that with um, a setting of a poem by, by the French symbolist Paul Verlaine called Mandolin from Debussy's first set of Fête Galante. And these were a set of songs that Debussy wrote based around um, the figures of the Commedia dell'arte, which were a group of circus players um, and street performers that inspired, um, also had very long history, but inspired Picasso's um, Harlequin um, and Blue Period paintings. This had a couple of uh, of, of potential problems in that we needed to transpose the music into the guitar because we didn't have a piano, but the, it really got back to the folk ethos and we sort of heard this music in a new way um, in a response to sort of having to transpose um, the piano score um, onto a guitar. Quite different, um, but very research led, was the music that we put together for um, the Michelangelo um, exhibition uh, in uh, 20, 2010, um, which we actually reran in the Master Drawings show in 2014. And this was music relating um, to the set of presentation drawings um, that, Tommaso, uh, that Michelangelo made for Tommaso de Cavalieri, and of which we um, in the Courtauld have this, this piece, The Dream. Um, now, I discovered that Michelangelo had commissioned a composer, Jakob Arkadelt, to write a piece um, or to set some of, of his poetry to music. And I found a score um, languishing of all places in um, Senate House in a 19th century copy. Um, and so we, we pulled this out and I put it together with letters that we had from Michelangelo um, praising the music for being beautiful. And so we, we brought this music to life um, and uh, performed it in the gallery. These were pieces that weren't at that point in circulation in modern, modern scores or modern um, editions. And the significance of this was um, was several fold. Um, for one thing, the publication of the Archidelt um, Madrigals setting Michelangelo's poetry was in uh, 1538, which means that the poetry had to be written before 1538, which hadn't been realised by Michelangelo poetry scholars. Um, Michelangelo's poetry received wider audience through publication as libretti, um, as song texts, because Archidelt's book went through 55 editions in 50 years. And this includes during Michelangelo's lifetime, but actually Michelangelo's poetry as poetry wasn't published during his lifetime anywhere. So this was a really significant moment of recognizing the publication of his poetry um, more broadly. And then um, th I'm going to leave this for, for you just to have a look up um, later. But I asked or invited James Weeks and Exaudi to perform the two original pieces by Archidelt. And this inspired James to write his own new book of, of um, madrigals, uh, which had it, which has just been recorded for um, the Durham University's music um, online music programme. And it was um, premiered last week. Um, and so that's the web link at the bottom there. But if you look up um, the Book of Flames and Shadows and Durham University, um, you'll find James's rewrite of these pieces, um, which he first discovered um, during this event. 
So gallery music has also had a life beyond the Courtauld. Often we're the catalyst and we inspire something and then um, a project spreads wings, a bit like James's um, new piece that I've just mentioned. The slide here is um, Boris Vlacher's abstract Oper Nummer 1 from uh, 2012 where we um, worked with, um, inspired by um, Auerbach's uh, London Building Sites exhibition um, and wanted to experiment with uh, model uh, light techniques um, and of course couldn't do that in a gallery setting so we hopped next door to Catherine's home um, at King's um, and we performed it in the Anatomy Theatre and Museum in a series of workshops there which um, these are stills from. And then the Francis Bacon Opera, um, which was a contemporary piece by the composer Stephen Crow, he's here. Um, this um, sets the interview between Francis Bacon and Melvin Bragg, and we performed extracts of that um, in the gallery in relation to the works where um, Bacon is saying how much he likes or dislikes various artists, and we paired up as closely as we could. Um, and this uh, went on to the Tete Tete Opera Festival. It won um, the Hilton Edwards Award in 2013. And then it also had a second outing in Berlin in 2017, a few years later. And there's uh, some, uh, some slides from that. And then, of course, there's um, the um, Outreach Higher Education Programme. And the best example for you for this is really um, a project I ran with Euphonia Studio in 2016 on Britain's Turn of the Screw. So what you have on the screen here are four, um, four slides from um, the production that we, um, we did of the entire opera um, in uh, Rye Arts um, Festival and we, um, um, Alistair and I made these, um, or Alistair made them, we designed these, these, uh, these sets. And um, this was in combination with a um, schools workshop based on Georgiana Halton, which was our starting point for thinking about Henry James's story, um, The Turn of the Screw. So this is a Georgiana Halton untitled drawing up here. And we use this to think about surrealism and automatic drawing and ghost stories um, and the trans translation of um, or an expression of emotion into visual and oral media. And this was working with A-level students at um, a um, higher education um, or A-level academy, Rye Academy, um, which had um, a large proportion of students from first generation higher education families. So they came to watch the production and we did a series of workshops um, in and around it. And this is just some of the work that, that they produced. So the shift to present cultural and historical subjects um, as all singing and all dancing multimedia spectacles represents a very significant change in the way that exhibitions are experienced and consumed. There's a lot of evidence that creativity can be thought and encouraged and taught through a museum. Um, and we've been using music really for audiences. We've been using it to extend the reach of the exhibition by involving the audience more actively and creatively, and also to engage audiences and communities that um, we could otherwise find um, harder to attract. And we're not alone in this. Lots of museums have been doing this and um, the success in general has led Lawrence Kramer to quip, why can't concert halls be more like museums? Um, but on the other hand, treasure, uh, leisure websites such as TripAdvisor in the UK at least, still rate museums by how quiet they are. Um, so exactly the opposite. Um, and passive options like taking an audio guide um, are rarely um, taken up. There's evidence that people go for the active live events rather than, um, than the more sort of passive um, didactic approach. So we know for the last 20 years that active learning methods are um, more, um, more lasting than passive ones. And we know too that with active focused events, the average time spent looking at artworks by gallery audience increases. So by programming um, music, for instance, um, it can improve attention and collaboration um, with the audience um, through um, performance and concentration. So I'd suggest that many museums um, have planned a lot of intermedia events um, as fixes to changing preconceptions of museums from dusty sites of empirical knowledge and studious silence to being lively active spaces or to open, um, open up their doors somehow um, or to tick some boxes um, for funding requirements. Um, and with all that in mind, um, with the research-led gallery music programme, we've been trying very hard to stimulate reflection more broadly on sound and silence in current museum practice advocating that carefully curated intermedia events 
can be compelling for their potential to focus um, attentive, perceptive and reflective looking and listening. So I think I'm going to hand back to Leila now. Um, I'm sorry, that's quite a whistle stop tour of what we've been up to for the last 10 years. Um, I'm looking forward to being open and being able to share some more of this work in person with you in due course. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Charlotte. It's so great to see what happened at the court all before I actually started working here. <laughs> well, I am started, I think I was in Somerset House for one day. Um, so yeah, that's really great. Um, we have a question for you and it's actually about whether you're a musician yourself and if you are what you practice uh, I would say I'm, I'm an amateur musician I was a bad oboist I'm I'm a singer um I sing in a in a in a small chamber choir um I'm a very bad pianist um so so yeah so 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 so, so in an amateur sense yes um nothing more than that <laughs> great thank you um I used to play the violin and at school, everyone knew I was walking along because I used to have a pink violin. I was that child, <laughs> not the colourful violin. I wasn't very good, but at least I had a cool violin. <laughs> well, thank you again so much, Charlotte, for joining us. Um, I wanted to say as well that the Precious and Rare will be at the Holborn in Bath and it'll, it's actually opening Monday, the 17th of May now. And that if you're interested in anything, you should go look at our website and learn more about the Courtauld Connects project more generally. So now I am excited to be joined by August McGregor, Jessica Smith and Stephanie Edwards. So Stephanie is an exhibitions assistant at Ferrens Art Gallery in Hull, while August and Jessica are currently students and members of Future Ferrens. And Future Ferrens, for those of you who don't know, is made up of 16 to 25 year old volunteer curators, promoters and creatives. And over the past year, they've been working to curate the Money and Mind exhibition in partnership with the Courtauld. So thank you three for being here this evening and congratulations on the exhibition. It just got announced this morning. So how are you all feeling? I imagine you're all very tired. Yeah, very. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, very excited to open on Monday and um, it's been a long road. So it is thrilling to see it actually all come together now. Yeah, definitely. So I thought I would start um, by asking if you could tell us about all things Future Ferrens, maybe frame it a bit better than I just did, and also the Money and Mind exhibition that you've been working on. Yeah, definitely. So Future Ferrens, you explained very well. Um, so our volunteers are 16 to 25 year olds and they um, work in collaboration with gallery staff like myself to produce um, exhibitions, events, from anything to um, pop-up exhibitions to full late events taking over the entire gallery and the, the aim is basically to invite in people that maybe haven't even visited the gallery before and engage people with art in a new way and Future Parents has been going since gosh like 2006 so there's been many, many exhibitions and I won't list them all, um, but um, it has been a, a thrilling ride. I was a feature friend myself before I started working in the gallery. And um, so there's been a lot of projects that have really challenged the way that Ferens thinks and invited people into a different way of thinking and a different conversation. So that sort of feature friends in a nutshell. If, if, we, if I can um, blurb down uh, over a decade of work. Um, but yes, like you said, the Future Ferrens have taken part over the past year and a bit in curating the Monet in Mind exhibition. So the exhibition is um, centered and inspired by um, Claude Monet's work Antibes, which is painted in 1888, which the court hall is genuinely loaned to the Ferrens as part of the National Partners Programme. And the exhibition seeks to look at mindfulness and reflective practice um, to engage with the artworks in a new way and also in a response to the pandemic to give a different kind of space for people to engage in art, which I think is, is quite pertinent when we are opening 
off the back of Mental Health Awareness Week, I think it is really relevant for people to engage with as well. So the exhibition itself, as I said, Antibes is the star and the centre, but it's also been accompanied by works chosen from our permanent collection and chosen by the future Ferrans who have curated the exhibition, who have designed the gallery space, who have written the interpretation, basically done everything. I don't know why I'm here, but <laughs> the future Ferrans have done an amazing job and um, they've pulled it all together. And so it is really a wonderful exhibition um, due to their efforts over the, like I said, over the past year and a bit <laughs> due to the pandemic. That's amazing. Thank yeah, we, and we've got joined with two of us, the Future Ferrans as well. We've got August and Jess who have both taken part and done different parts of the project. So they'll, they can tell you better than I can what they've been doing. Yeah, great. Well, I guess that's kind of my next question actually, is more about why you chose um, the money and also why you fe felt like it was so important in the context of 2020, 2021. Yeah, yeah, very important. Maybe I take you back right to the start of the project, which was January 2020. <laughs> and um, the course hold offered us one of seven Impressionist artworks by well-known Impressionist artists. And um, we are very keen at the Ferrans to give young people a chance to speak up in cultural decision making and give the decisions directly over to them so that's what we did and we gave um the opportunity for young people across Hull to take part in a public vote on which one they wanted and the winner was of course Monet's on Thieves and um people said that it was calming that it was relaxing that having a landscape without any figures allowed them to be transported into the landscape themselves and this was a South of France painting. So it is beautiful, stunning Mediterranean landscapes with the most amazing palette of colors. And Monet said he painted the magical air of Antibes and you could believe it when you're looking at it as well. So that, that's how it came about that we chose Antibes. And then uh, perhaps August can tell you a bit more about what uh, happened from there yeah. on, really. As you were saying, um, a lot of the feedback is with the vote. It wasn't just people voting, just on the checking box, they were giving feedback on why they would make the decisions. And one of the things that did keep coming up was this idea of reflection and mindfulness, which was prevalent enough we decided that it was something we could definitely build the exhibition on. So we chose a lot of land, not just landscapes, but also some more abstract paintings as well to go with it. That So in a sense, on paper, it might seem quite collective, but all, what they all had in common, the paintings were that, they're ones that people found to be relaxing and meditative and they could think about and stand in front of and reflect. And in 2020, this was obviously something that was quite prevalent for a lot of people who were having to reflect and having a lot more time to themselves. And um, and then obviously that was meant to launch in 2020 in August and then January and now is launching finally next week in May. So things have changed quite a lot, but the fact that there's still a time for self-reflection, there's still a need for it now, it still remains the same. And even though it might have shifted in the exact intent, it's still very much applicable with mental health and the fact that people are going to have to reflect and also adjust to a new challenge and coming back to a post-COVID world, fingers crossed. Mm, yeah, no, I think this idea of mindfulness mm -hmm. is really interesting in terms of this artwork in this particular moment. And I think you framed that really wonderfully. And I wondered, before I get the questions from the audience, if anyone could talk through the process to include music, a musical element at least, in the curation of this exhibition and why you felt it was so important. Yeah, um, we kind of started by making some like relaxing mindfulness films. Um, and so along with that, we had to choose music and we kind of gravitated towards relaxing, calming, um, chilled out music. And we also wanted to have this like sensory element to the exhibition as, um, you know, it's been a long time coming and we weren't able to get into the gallery, but like having this soundtrack that we created through like the Spotify playlist um, 
that could be accessed through like a QR code or through the website kind of acted like this other tangible element to the, to the paintings. Um, yeah, and I think, I feel like a musical element to an exhibition could be extremely beneficial, especially in the case of like this exhibition at Ferrand's and it's so focused on mindfulness. And for me anyway, music is kind of like the ultimate escapism from the outside world. Like, um, yeah, noise cancelling headphones on. And um, we kind of wanted to give people the opportunity to like have this escapism through the art in the exhibition, but then also through the music that we provided. Yeah, and just to add on, I think it's also very much, as we were putting the, the playlist, um, it was some put together their own ones, and then there was some that we submitted songs to, and so that everyone had a slightly different take on what then was reflective music and more mindful. So myself, I gravitate to a lot more ambient electronic music, whereas I know a lot of people prefer even lyrics or vocals or like more um, traditional music as well. So it's really fascinating to see what different people take from it. We hope that like by sharing this music, people will hopefully be able to think about what helps them reflect as well. Mm, that's really interesting. Now I'm trying to think about what helps me relax. And <laughs> the first thing that came to my head was ABBA and I don't think that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all. It's really inspiring and congratulations again on such um, a huge piece of work under really difficult circumstances. And it's amazing you've managed to pull this all together. And I think what you're saying makes me think of slow looking and actually using music, having your headphones on and just having your own space and being able to actually look and think about art in different ways. Super fascinating. And um, so if anyone has any questions, please pop them in the chat and I can ask them or does anyone else have anything else to say about the exhibition or anything else you wanted to flag just now? How well, can people access it? That's a good yeah. one. <laughs> um, so uh, for from Monday onwards for the exhibition, you can go to moneyandmind.com and you'll be able to find links to all the playlists and also soundscapes that uh, students at the local college have created in response to the artworks as part of the playlists as well. So all everything, everything related to the exhibition and the um, the reflective practice that was included uh, will be on moneyandmind.com. Um, yes, so we, I have one question now. So this will be our question before we move on. What other works are in the exhibition? And this is Ernst asking August and Jessica. Um, there's a really huge variety of works, honestly. Um, so we've got some other like landscapes and watercolors from the um, uh, 19th century. There's, um, I believe, a Henry Dawson um, maritime painting. There's a couple of really small um, paintings by a painting, a painting I did a lot of research into, William Townley Benson, who was a um, Canadian-American itinerant painter on the Mexican border in the early 1900s, which is just something most, I think, the Ferrans is the only public gallery in the world that showcases these works by this artist. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, there's a Richard Longprint as well in the exhibition. So there's a really huge spectrum of works. There's some abstract, there's some impressionist, there's some, as I said, landscapes and watercolors. So it's really, hopefully something for everyone to find interesting. Great, thank you. And yeah, I can see in the chat, lots of people are saying how inspiring it is as a project. So yeah, well done again. And thank you for just showing us how great it can be to go back into the gallery space as well. I'm sure everyone who is tuning in will be just raring to go to get back. So thank you all. And um, so now we're moving on to our last segment of the evening, something which I think is going to be a treasured addition when we reopen our gallery doors. I am delighted to say that Gaia agreed to do a musical commission for us. And this ties up what we've actually been saying throughout this whole hour. Um, and it gives a really beautiful, melodic and calming means to end this hour. So Guy is a strings duo made up of Katrina and Alice, and this duo, Chamber Music, Scotland's Ensemble in Residence, 2019 to 2021, are passionate about amplifying women's voices where they haven't been heard before. And their vision is to unveil the unheard and unseen voices of female composers from the past, while supporting our female contemporaries through cross genre collaboration and performance which brings them perfectly to the open court strand today. So thank you both for this absolutely 
stunning piece that we're going to play to the audience in just a second. But before we do that, I wondered if you wanted to briefly let us know where you were coming from and when you made this and if there's anything specific about the painting that really inspired you. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for having us. It's honestly such a, a privilege and a real um, delight to have been offered this commission by the Courtauld Gallery. Um, we're, we're so happy and obviously as freelance musicians the past year has been incredibly difficult on, um, you know, on our livelihoods, our community. And um, to have this um, has just been so refreshing and just wonderful to be able to work with um, such a stunning piece of work as well. Um, so it's been a really uh, wonderful journey of creating, um, you know, most of it virtually, but, um, you know, it's been a great time to explore different sounds and ideas together. So I think Alice is going to tell you a little bit more about um, our collaboration. Yeah, thanks Katrina. And it's just, yeah, to echo that, it's so lovely to be here this evening. Um, so we were totally delighted to see um, on Thebes and to work with this. Um, and as um, everyone's been talking about um, before, we both, it was really interesting when we both had a very similar reaction to it, which was that sense of real tranquility, um, but picked up straight away on all the textures within this um, amazing, amazing piece of art and it does it totally takes you in and it takes you to the place and we really really wanted to um, reflect that in what we wrote so straight away we we felt like you know there were so many sort of textual dimensions to this that we wanted to find that in our music and through our instruments so you'll you'll hear in the piece lots of um sounds like um at the opening um, we start, we use a kind of texture called sol pont, which is playing by the bridge. Um, and the, when you have your bow, you normally have this sort of section where your teacher always says play here and you get a nice rich sort of resonant sound. Um, but if you push up to the bridge, you start to get more um, of a glassy kind of texture and you get lots of overtones. So other notes start to ring um, as well as the one that you want. So you get all these sort of like shimmery, miragey type of effects and um, you know it's so exciting to try and find those to represent that that really emphatic feeling that I think we both you know it really does um, have something special and atmospheric so we we really wanted to create that. Um, Katrina did you have any other things I know that we've talked so much about this so much to say but um, no I, I just completely agree yeah the, um, the different everything we tried to capture from the um, image that we saw I mean we felt like we could carry on for a lot longer even with the piece and um, so it was hard to sort of contain it to um, the the time so we we just hope you really enjoy it and we want to say thank you so much again. No I'm sure everyone really enjoy it obviously I've already heard it so I'm privileged in this <laughs> sense but yeah I'm um, when we reopen we definitely need to get you both down to London and you can see it in real life because I'm have you have you seen the artwork in real life before no just yeah so it's amazing you've managed to come up with this piece just from a um a digital image but yeah thank you both so much again for all of your time and effort making this and coming on tonight to introduce and a pleasure so what, thank you so what we'll do now is we'll play the piece for everyone so they can enjoy it at home thank you
How amazing was that? Thank you again. And thank you to everyone else, Catherine, Charlotte, Stephanie, August and Jessica for joining us this evening. And thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies again for your support and for everyone for tuning in from home. So that's all we have for tonight. But yeah, please do sign up for the next two Open Core Talk Hours. One will be on hair moments on the 3rd of June. And then the next one will be a night at the theatre on the 1st of July. So I look forward to seeing you all again. So thank you all and good night. <laughs>